What's up, eco nerdlings? In today's podcast, we're going to be discussing soil formation and the properties of soil. So by definition, soil is a relatively thin surface layer of the Earth's crust, consisting of mineral and organic matter that's affected by agents such as weather, wind, water, as well as organisms. So soil is composed of four distinct parts. We have the mineral particles, which compose about 45% of the typical soil sample. Then we have organic matter. These are things that have been living or alive. They contain carbon, and that composes about 5% of soil. Water and air, which both compose about 25% of soil. So soil is obviously very important to us, as well as many other organisms. Organisms, or mainly microorganisms, inhabit the soil, and they depend upon it for shelter, food, and water. Plants, which we obviously need for oxygen so we can breathe and complete the process of cellular respiration, which is why we have oxygen to begin with, because it is the final electron acceptor. Um, plants anchor themselves into the soil, and they get their nutrients in water. Terrestrial plants couldn't survive without soil, and obviously, like I just stated, therefore, we couldn't survive without soil either. So soil, is it or is it not a renewable resource? It kind of depends. Soil is a very slowly renewed resource that provides most of the nutrients needed for plant growth, and it also helps to purify water. Soil formation begins when bedrock is broken down by physical, chemical, and biological processes called weathering. Mature soils, or soils that have developed over a long time, are arranged in a series of horizontal layers called soil horizons. So we also have soil and it comes from a parent material. The parent material is a rock that's been slowly broken down into small, uh, smaller particles by biological, chemical, and physical weathering. And it forms uh, about 2.5 centimeters of soil in 200 to 1,000 years. So soil is replenished in a very, very slow manner. So again, it takes 200 to 1,000 years to form about 2.5 centimeters or about an inch of soil. So we have our different types of weathering that we just talked about. We have physical weathering, and this is going to be erosion caused by wind, water, ice, and it's going to slowly erode away that rock. We also have chemical weathering. In a plant's roots or animal cells, they undergo cellular respiration and they produce carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide that those animals produce diffuses into the soil and it reacts with water to form carbonic acid. That's how chemical weathering occurs. We have that carbonic acid that starts to eat away parts of the rock and again, that rock starts to get broken apart. So again, renewable or non-renewable. Decomposition produces new soil. However, we also have instances in which the soil really isn't being replaced because of human interference, like cutting down the trees in the rainforest. So in the tropical rainforest, all of those nutrients that the soil contains are caught up in the trees. And whenever the tree dies, instead of that going back into the soil, since we're cutting all of the trees down, we're basically removing all of those nutrients from the ecosystem. So it's not going to go back into the soil to be able to fertilize other plants. So soil has different types of properties. It has texture, and this is the percentages by weight of different sized particles of sand, silt, and clay that the soil actually contains. So texture, you can feel it. It's a texture. Like if I'm feeling this right now, I could say the texture of it is very, very smooth. It's soft. So anything that's more than two millimeters in diameter is considered to be gravel or stones, and it's not actually going to be classified as soil because it doesn't have any type of direct value for plants. It doesn't contain any nutrients or anything like that that the plants can actually utilize. Any particles that are between 0.05 to two millimeters are considered to be sand, and those are the largest particles of soil that we can see easily with our naked eye. Any soil particles that are going to be 0.002 to 0.05 millimeters are considered to be silt. And it's about the size as well as texture of flour, and it's barely visible to the naked eye. And then anything smaller than that, or smaller than 0.002 or two thousandths of a millimeter, is going to be considered to be clay. And that has the greatest surface value. 
and you can only see it under a microscope. So again, texture, we can use uh, just rubbing it between our fingers to determine what type of soil it is and what it contains the most of. So to tell the difference in soil, you take the soil, moisten it, and then you rub it between your fingers and your thumb to see what type of texture it is and what it's made out of. If it's really, really gritty, it has a lot of sand in it. If it's real sticky and you play with it and it gets kind of dried out, that's going to be considered uh, clay. Same thing if you still have it wet, you can actually roll it into little balls and things like that. You can actually play with it. And then silt is going to be very smooth and it's going to have the consistency of flour. Very, very soft, very, very smooth. So the structure is how soil particles are organized and clumped together. Again, sand, silt, clay, and how are they put together? What is the consistency of that soil? So we have friability. This is how easily the soil can be crumbled. So if you can crumble it very, very easily, it's going to be very friable. Porosity. This is a measure of the volume of soil and the average distance between spaces. Some soil is going to be much more porous than others. The larger the particles, the more porous it's going to be. We also have permeability. This is the rate at which water and air moves from the upper layer of the soil to the lower layer of the soil. It is distances between those spaces. So if we have soil with very large particles like sand particles, it's going to be very, very permeable. It's not going to take too long for that water to go from the top surface to the bottom. If we have soil that's composed of clay, it's going to take a lot longer for that water to reach the lower layers. So clay is not as permeable as sand is. So soil is very rich in, in the size of particles they contain and the amount of space between these particles, as well as how rapidly water flows through them, are again another property of the soils. So sand, like I was saying, is going to be very, very large particles. It's going to be very porous and very permeable. Clay is going to be less porous and much less permeable because all of those little particles are packed in very, very tightly and it doesn't allow much to go in between them. So we also have what we call a shrink swell potential and this occurs a lot in clay. So it happens whenever water is added, the clay basically swells up, gets real slimy and slippery, but whenever it dries out, it tends to shrink up and crack. This is very bad type of soil to build your houses on because it can affect the foundation of housing drastically. pH is another property that we use to measure soil. And the pH of most, most soils ranges from about 4.0 to 8.0, so kind of acidic to slightly basic. However, we do have extremes of this. Most of the soil in the pygmy forest in California is actually extremely acidic. It has a pH of 2.8 to 3.9. And Death Valley is the opposite. Death Valley in California actually has a pH that's very basic of 10.5. Plants are going to be affected by the pH because of the solubility of nutrients and minerals that they can uptake. Different types of slopes can also affect soil types. Steep slopes often have very little to no soil on them because of gravity and constant erosion. Runoff from precipitation tends to erode the slope also. Moderate slopes, however, tend to have valleys that can actually encourage the formation of very deep soils. Speaking of, we also have the depth of the soil. So some soils are extremely shallow, like in places in San Antonio. It can be only about two inches of soil, and then you'll hit rock. Other areas can have over three feet or 36 inches of soil. So soil is also classified based on its color. If it has a very dark color, that soil is going to be very, very rich in nutrients and organic matter. If the soil is very light, like sand you might see in a sandbox, it's not going to be too much in it. It's not very rich in nutrients and it has very little to no organic matter. Well, I hope you learned a lot about soil or dirt. If you would like to rewatch this podcast or any others for AP Environmental Science, go to my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off. Stay nerdy till next time.